All right, so I think we are stabilizing right now in terms of number of uh, uh, people joining us. So good morning, everybody. Good evening for some of you in, in the very far. Okay, let's adjust that briefly. Good morning, Nilo. How are you doing today? Morning, Sebastian. I'm doing good. A good night's sleep. Yeah. So let's ask just a few things. We have more people to come. That's great. So once again, thank you for joining us today. This is uh, our second session on, on the Dirac Art. We had another session yesterday evening, and it was really amazing the number of questions we had. So we are really impatient to start this new session with you. Um, and well, let's let's not wait uh, any longer. Um, today's webinar is about active wound treatment, direct live. I'm today with Nilo Casimiro Erickson, who will introduce himself. Yes, uh, Good thank morning, you. Morning, Nilo. Yeah, um, I hear him. Okay. Uh, very well. I think uh, okay, sound is good. Great. Video is good. Yes. We're Just good to go. Um, yeah, so um, Nilo Kasmir Eriksson. I'm a product owner and also product lead for the Direct Live uh, product family at Direct Research. I'm also co founder of the company. So I've been with uh, this is the only job I had basically uh, during the last 20 years. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, share the, the well, information about active and treatment together with uh, Sebastian from Storm Audio. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And it's a real pleasure also for us to to have the expert uh, explaining what it is uh, behind. So I'm Sebastian Gaiton, head of product and support here at Storm Audio. Uh, we we had uh, many other webinars in the past uh, years, let's say, uh, and I'm very happy to to see you all again today. Uh, so what we have on the table is is we'll go through a little bit of room acoustics. Well, actually, we'll not do uh, acoustic in details. We'll just look at what the room uh, brings to uh, to the system. Uh, we'll discuss about Dirac and all its evolution that that uh, um, drive us to to art. Uh, we'll talk about active room treatment in in details, so you get a really good understanding of of the technology. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session that we expect to be quite lengthy. Uh, uh, and and um, and by the way, you have a question box uh, uh, somewhere in your menu. Please use this to raise all your questions. Uh, raise them at any time. We may not answer them during the presentation, but we will make sure that at the end we will have enough time to cover, if not all of them, most of them. You also are able to download the handouts uh, already now. Uh, it's a PDF file that has exactly all the contents, so don't take any screenshots. Uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, the session is recorded, so you will get a link after the presentation. So let's uh, let's not wait for more, and and let's go into uh, some some company presentation. This webinar is actually open to a broad audience, so it's important that we we introduce that. And and Nilo, please. Yeah. So uh, Dirac uh, was founded in 2001 by uh, researchers at the Uppsala University, uh, which is in Sweden. Uh, we research, develop, and maintain a large portfolio of uh, audio algorithms that we license to help device manufacturers deliver superior sound to end users. Uh, Dirac is a global company. We have the headquarters still in Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, we have also R&D facilities in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark and in Bangalore, India. Uh, and totally globally, we have about 110 employees and about 20% of them are uh, PhDs uh, in some audio or signal processing uh, related area. Uh, we have also local representation in most of the markets we're in, uh, including the United States, Greater China, Germany, Japan, Korea, and uh, India. And um, we're not only doing like room correction for home audio, where uh, our biggest uh, leg is actually automotive, uh, where we help manufacturers of cars to deliver superior sound inside the cars. Uh, I can mention, for example, Volvo, uh, BMW, Bentley, Rolls-Royce as a few of our customers. 
Uh, we have 17 patent families, obviously, um, quite a wide thing, but everything is within audio in, in different ways, uh, including the impulse response correction, MIMO control, psychoacoustics, and uh, stereo to multi-channel up mixing as well. Yeah, that's a short introduction of, of Dirac. And um, what we, in this context of, of home audio, we're about uh, room correction uh, and digital room correction. And the central theme in, in the Dirac solution is that it's always measurement based so that the actual situation in in, in in each room can be addressed properly by our algorithms. Um, so having done the measurements with a microphone, um, a computer will analyze them and uh, create the model for that uh, for that room, how that room is distorting the sound, um, and then our algorithm will calculate a filter that will revert that uh, distortion or of course assuming that a, a linear distortion um, and eventually that filter will end up in a device such as the storm audio uh, isp uh, processors yeah and that's that's the, like the whole story uh, from measurement to a filter that runs in the fil in, in the processor and uh, gives you superior sound yeah, so thanks, Nilo, for, for this company introduction. And, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, this goes into uh, devices, and, and Storm Audio is, is uh, definitely an actor of the uh, uh, audio video reproduction. Um, Storm Audio is a is company uh, uh, which was funded in, in 2010. We are uh, nowadays about 20 employees uh, worldwide, uh, uh, with uh, 16 being in France and, and rest uh, uh, in, in the US and Hong Kong. So our headquarters is in France. Uh, we are uh, uh, developing and manufacturing in France, uh, uh, mainly immersive sound processors and receivers, meaning integrated uh, uh, amplifiers and processors, as well as multi-channel amplifiers. They are all dedicated to the high-end audio video reproductions. So whether this is for home cinema, but not only. Uh, uh, nowadays, you will see more and more multi-purpose room where actually you have a big open space that is shared for some time watching a movie, some time enjoying listening playback, but also gathering people all around. So that's that's really where uh, our devices are, are really flexible and helps create all these environments. You also can enjoy this in, in multiple rooms, uh, and that is also possible with the uh, Storm Audio products. And, and recently, uh, we see more and more interest uh, on our products in the uh, mastering studios because of our integration of the audio over IP being the AS67 or the Dante that fits perfectly into the mixing console environment where you can actually do the mixing and the uh, press mastering verifications. Uh, using the processor to decode the, uh, the, the the stream that you actually mixed. So that's that's really where uh, Storm Audio products are are strong. Uh, the company is is really built around all the uh, let's say a residential space at the moment. So this is meant to be for integrators uh, in, with in mind, uh, meaning that we provide all the tools that they need uh, to set up properly the room systems, speakers and all that and provide the best performance in, in any room. And, and this is where actually it was fundamental for a brand like Storm Audio to have the best room calibration ever in the system to make sure that you can compensate for whatever issues you will get. And this is the topic of today's webinar. Uh, Storm Audio stands for uh, modularity and flexibility. I mean, initially the first ISP, so the MK1 was made with uh, multiple slots in the back of the product so that you can fit multiple options and select the different uh, functions that you were you were looking for. So whether this was more audio and, and I mean input and outputs, or whether you wanted to have digital or analog, this was definitely possible thanks to this modularity and flexibility. Reliability is is our uh, really second most important, uh, let's say, DNA in the company. We want to make sure that our products that are quite an investment are sustainable over time, not only in terms of stability, reliability, but also uh, upgradability. So that's that's really key. It has to be ease of, easy to use, and, and that's all about our user interface. The tool that we use from our partners, such as Dirac, that makes the calibration work uh, a, a nice experience and not a too complicated one. And in the end, we do provide premium support 
uh, to ensure that uh, whatever you do with the product, you do it well, and, and that in case of any trouble on site, you can always have someone to help you in, in, in fixing the issues. So that's about Storm Audio. And, and uh, uh, right now we'll be looking at, let's say, what to together Dirac and Storm Audio is bringing to the sound reproduction. And it all starts by fixing some goals about what sound reproduction is. When, when you do create an environment to reproduce audio and video, you are looking for some, some basic criteria that really makes what we could describe as the quality of the sound reproduction. And one of them, and especially when you look at home cinema, is about getting clear dialogue and articulation. So you need to be able at any time in any seat to get a clear understanding of the dialogues and mainly what comes from the main screen speakers. That's really important. The sound should be precisely located. So whenever you have some effects that should be somewhere coming from another, a very specific place in the room, that has to be precisely rendered in the system. So precise non localization. Any pan of an effect has to be really smooth. You need to make sure that there is no kind of a scale effect. It has to be really smooth from speaker to speaker. And this is critical to also create the sound field immersion, the envelopment sensation. So it's not only about an object moving, but it's also about to get all the small noise and sound that are added to the soundtrack to make the experience more realistic uh, possible. Timber has to be really tonally balanced. What this means is that, and this is especially more important with objects, when you have sounds that can pan from the front to the back, you want to make sure that whenever the travel the different speakers, you do not have a change in the color of the sound. And that is really important. And that comes from speaker selection, but also uh, uh, from, from the good uh, calibration of the room. Pool dynamics, it is extremely important when we talk about home cinema, especially when you have subwoofer in place, they have to be able to drive up to 115 dB, I mean, sound pressure level, which is quite high. And, and that means that the whole system has to be prepared for that. So for subwoofers and speakers, and, and that's really one of the key. And not at the cost of losing transparency. So the system has to be capable to provide not only high dynamics, but also to render the very little details in, in, in a good manner. And, and this at any different seats. So if you have multiple seats in the room, the calibrator, his target is to make sure that he can have as much as possible seats with the, the similar performance. It's not always achievable to have all of them, but you need to try to optimize as many seats as possible, not only for, let's say, the broad aspect, but especially for the base that is more sensitive in, in room like home cinema rooms. I mentioned audience coverage, and that's key. You want to make sure that if you have several persons that they have the similar experience at any time. And of course, you want this to be uh, not at the cost of having your neighbor not happy. So those are the different uh, goals that, that we do have when, when uh, any installator, uh, installer, sorry, any integrator uh, works in defining a room, a song reproduction room, he is looking for achieving these different uh, uh, elements. And this, this uh, uh, actually is not an easy task, especially when you go into the uh, uh, residential environment, because the rooms, usually the rooms where you do the reproduction, are not really big. And, and why this is a problem? Because room is actually the issue and comes with multiple issues. Speakers are designed in, let's say, to be uh, working in three fields. So this is the so-called anechoic chamber measurement. So when you look at the speaker, uh, whatever you, 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 you get in, in, in the response that is provided to you uh, is uh, by uh, having done uh, on, on, on an anechoic chamber. And the effect is that whenever you use the speaker in a room, this is all changed and you get uh, uh, many different effects that are uh, uh, coming from uh, mainly the walls to start with, but also uh, the furniture, the windows, and, and this uh, creates a, a lot of problems. And the main issue comes from the reflected sound. So, uh, uh, and, and Nilo will explain that very uh, in very details, but reflected sounds, you, you are all familiar with now the room modes, meaning whenever you put a speaker in the room or a subwoofer in the room, you will excite the modes. And the modes is something that is really related to the physics of the room. You can do nothing about it. You have to just deal with it. And with the reflections, you get many, many, many problems like interferences, uh, recombination, 
that will uh, uh, make, let's say, coloration of the sound. And on top of it, because of the size of the room and all that, you will get some reverberation in ECU. And here, I think uh, Nilo can give some, some more explanation about what is behind uh, these, these different problems. Yeah, so um, we're dealing with speakers in, in a room and um, uh, the sound that travels from, from a speaker will go through, um, first of all, some uh, refraction around the, the edges of the speaker cabinet itself, and then it will spread in the room, you get reflections as, as indicated in the, in the illustrations here, what Sebastian said. Um, eventually it reaches your ears and it will uh, then have been smeared out by uh, the different contributions from different directions and different coloration because of uh, the, the reflections. And the sound will not be as clear and transparent as it would have been in a, in a free field uh, transmission. So in effect, uh, the sound will be smeared out in time and also colored in, uh, in frequency between because of the reflections and the interference that the, uh, the reflections are causing. Um, and this time smearing, um, most of all, it's detrimental um, to the uh, psychoacoustic imaging that you would get, the staging between, for example, the left and right uh, speaker. So if, if the contributions from the left and right are not equal, uh, sufficiently equal, then it, our brain will not buy the the idea of a phantom center, for example. Um, so it's it's very important, especially for the uh, for the imaging and the staging of the sound. But of course, also if it's that bad that it doesn't sound natural uh, at all, um, the, the timbre, for example, uh, then then you will lose all this immersion that you're after uh, when when you're uh, in a home cinema setting or also in a, in a stereo setup. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would like to stress most of all, the, the time domain uh, issues that you get from uh, the speaker interacting with the room and uh, before reaching, uh, before um, the sound, before uh, it reaches your ears. That doesn't sound natural and you don't get the, the, the imaging uh, yeah. as intended. Yeah, so and, and in the end it's, it's for the complete frequency range and, and in the room it's especially uh, visible with the with the base uh, where, where you will miss impact and all that so any installer uh, facing the room and that's everybody actually you're not uh, listening to your system outside uh, and outdoor so you need to cope with that so you need to work on on some solutions and historically when when designing a home cinema you have to go through different processes and uh, one of the first things that uh, we always recommend to do, and, and, and any installer is now familiar with this, is that you need to understand where you go. And, and it starts with the room and understanding the room, mainly about the modes that are, as indicated, by a sense uh, given by, by the physical dimension of the room, because uh, the, the, the walls uh, are, are in a such distance that they correspond to, uh, in a way, uh, uh, the wavelength of the low frequencies. So. The first thing is using tools uh, such as Smart Room EQ Wizard. I mean, many tools will offer today some room analysis, and this analysis will help you see, uh, based on on where you you have located your speakers, uh, 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 let's say from the first try, it will tell you where uh, the modes are. I mean, where you will have uh, uh, nulls and where you will have uh, peaks in the room. And the first thing is that you will try to optimize your seat positions. Based on that, you, you will make sure to avoid to be in, in the null, for example, because whatever you do there, you will never get any base. So that's that's really the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing that has been uh, uh, widely used in the home cinema and makes really good, um, let's say, uh, a, a good listening reproduction is to usually not go with a single sub that is quite impractical to use in, in many rooms. Uh, you will go for multiple subs because doing multiple subs, you will help uh, let's say leverage, the, I mean, mitigate the problems uh, in in the room and and also change a little bit uh, the the way the modes are are uh, are working in the room. So by by playing on on their positions in the room and there are there has been multiple studies about that. But going to two or four cells placed in in different locations, you'll be able to optimize uh, the seat to seat variation. Meaning make sure that in 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 the listening space 
uh, you, you get a quite even response. And that's, that's the second thing that you would look at uh, to, to optimize the song reproduction in, in, in the real, real life, let's say, room. The third aspect, when you start looking at uh, optimizing the song, and you cannot cope with that, the room with the walls, depending on the material, you will always end up with uh, the problematic reflections, creating reverberations and all that. Uh, and here, this is all about what we call the, the reflections of time. What you have to do is to optimize that. And optimize that is make, an, a, let's say, a clever use of uh, absorption and diffusion placed in uh, very specific uh, uh, areas on the walls that you can you can study by, uh, again, uh, the position of the speakers. And you will help uh, um, reduce uh, quite considerably already uh, the uh, decay time uh, in the higher frequency. So above, uh, above, let's say, the 500 hertz, it becomes easy to manage that. For the frequencies below, it, it becomes a bit more tricky because the frequencies are quite, I mean, the wavelengths are, are long enough that to, to, to really uh, uh, change the, um, let's say, uh, to control that, you need to have quite a uh, um, big size bass trap or LMOX resonator. And, and, and this is, is really about, uh, um, uh, this is really a problem, uh, let's say, you need to manage that. And that is all about uh, optimizing the reflection decay time. So acoustical treatment is key and you will never uh, go away from that. Where, I mean, whether this is with specific materials or whether this is in the conception of the room, so integration of ways to control the decay time, you will not cope, you will have to do that. And the last element of designing a room and, and giving, uh, uh, providing solutions that uh, would, um, would, would help uh, uh, improve that, you need to go into uh, making uh, calibrations. Uh, and the calibration is really what helps you I would say shape the acoustical response of your system, and and uh, uh, make sure that uh, the, the the speakers are are uh, well aligned against a certain target curve. Target curve being the uh, um, let's say a psychoacoustic response that you're looking for. So the way you want the sound to be perceived by by the audition the auditor. So all of these are solutions, and the last that comes is the calibration, and this is where. Uh, our, our uh, uh, let's say partnership with Dirac is so important, and this is uh, uh, where Dirac has worked uh, hard in the past years to, to bring solutions. And, and Nilo will uh, describe what the tools are. Yeah. So today we have like three main features uh, as we're uh, launching the active room treatment now as the third one. Um, so we started like in the 2000s, um, end of the 2000s. Uh, with the direct live room correction, which uh, does impulse response correction um, as part of the, the calibration step that uh, Sebastian is talking about. Um, about five years ago, we introduced base control, which is dealing uh, with the room modes and the variability of, um, of the base response across different seats. So uh, base control is giving you um, a way to integrate one or several subwoofers in your system in a good way um, to get this even response. And now uh, we're talking about active room treatment that we have been presenting at, at CES and ISC and that uh, Storm Audio will um, adopt uh, next. Yeah, and, and um, as you mentioned, you've been through a uh, multiple uh, level of the tools and, and we were really happy uh, to have passed this almost decade uh, working with you in, in uh, implementing this in, in our products. And, and to realize this, we, we, we had to uh, basically integrate like two DSPs just for the rack to ensure that we can not only look for uh, the high the channel count that we are uh, looking at, because we can cover up to 32 channels, but also, uh, let's say, the extensive uh, resource uh, requirements that some of the filters used uh, such as like the FIR that mentioned uh, that Nilo mentioned earlier, uh, but also the new uh, the new system that is used by Art uh, that that requires a lot of uh, uh, filters to to manage all the different speakers interacting. So this is the expertise that that Storm Audio has has brought uh, together with with the rack. So what what we what we need to do now is is to understand. Uh, let's say the, the the whole let's say trip that happened between this uh, first generation of the right life to correction and that led to 
uh, uh, to the active room treatment. So we'll, we'll uh, describe to you now uh, what happens. So, and the, the best way to do that is to start by, okay, uh, how is uh, the, the room behaving when, when you look at making some measurements? And we'll first look at the basic frequency response and the impulse response, which is uh, the time domain uh, a visualization of what a pulse uh, that is uh, given to a certain speaker uh, then ends up into uh, uh, when you measure it when played by the speaker in the room and when what you can see here uh, in the room that has absolutely no optimization um, you will see that uh, in in black uh, you you have what we call the average uh, response which is uh, looking at uh, um, the taking all the different measurements and you average them and you get a certain response. This is what I would say you would perceive mainly in, in when you sit in, in the reference reference listing position. You can see that this is quite accidented. I mean, there's there, there are a lot of uh, of uh, holes, bum, bum, et etc. And that that with variation here in the different response in in the multiple. Uh, uh, measurements. The, just to give you an, uh, some explanation, so all the blue curves are the multiple positions of measurements. So you have placed the microphone in the room. We, we take measurements in these different places and, and we put that all together in one trace. In black, this is the average and in blue, these are all the different speakers. And you can see that in the row frequency, you have a lot of variation. You also have that in the high frequency, but this is more linked to the, let's say, chaotic behavior on, in high frequency, which is not at all a problem compared to what you have in the low frequencies. Uh, mm -hmm. So this effect is what is, uh, uh, let's say, illustrated in the listening experience by uh, this lack of clarity, the loss of detail, the distorted sound stage, the muddy or boomy bass here in this location. And and uh, uh, may, maybe uh, maybe Nilo, you can give us some some explanation about why this is happening this way. <laughs> Yeah, so looking at the low frequency area there, uh, you, you have basically the effects of uh, the standing waves and resonances in the room, uh, which is due to the dimensions of the room. Uh, so you have the base variability uh, at certain frequencies, depending on where you are standing or where, where the mic has been positioned, uh, you will um, uh, you will experience a different amount of base. Um, and um, yeah, that's uh, basically what we see there. And you can see that uh, you have very, very uh, deep dips at, at some frequencies. Uh, so basically, you have no yeah. content on that particular frequency. Uh, looking at the impulse response now, which is the plot below there, and that's uh, the time domain. So you see how the, the amplitude or the, the excursion, the, the pressure of the sound uh, varies over time. Uh, ideally, that should look like a, like a spike, just a spike. But uh, what you can see here is an example of misaligned drivers. So the, the tweeter and the, the mid-range um, are not totally aligned. So you see that the, the high frequencies are coming first, and then there's like a, a slower response afterwards. And that, of course, is uh, is affecting how we uh, perceive the sound. It doesn't sound natural uh, with with that. Uh, and that's um, specific for for multi-way speakers that are not properly aligned. Okay. Um, and um, the the third contribution then is uh, that this sound is uh, refracted and diffract um, refracted and uh, um, no, diffracted and reflected um, around the speaker. Uh, so you have these early reflections uh, that also affect the mid to high uh, frequencies uh, mostly. And, and, and that's what we address uh, first of all with the direct live uh, root correction. Yeah, and, and this is what is illustrated here. So on, on that graph here, this is after the uh, uh, we apply the uh, room correction. Um, and what what you can see is is that you have first of all uh, a, a much more controlled response of the room. So here we we illustrate a flat response, right? But this is not obviously uh, the target that you have to follow. It's just to illustrate that you can by by controlling uh, um, the, the let's say the speakers, you can get an overall flat average response. But also 
uh, in the end, uh, and that's more, uh, I believe, and this is what Nilo will explain, you can see the impulse response is corrected. And, and that's what you will sense with a better clarity and, and a better precision in the sound, uh, reducing the time smearing. And, and I think here, uh, yeah, I mean, Nilo, you can give us more details and, and information about what Dirac has done with this in the room correction tool. Yes, uh, thanks. So, uh, first of all, uh, the, the filter that we uh, talked about previously that runs in the in the processor, it's uh, generally a mixed phase filter. Uh, mixed phase means that it's not a minimum phase and it's not a linear phase, it's some other phase uh, properties to that uh, filter. And that phase property has been um, uh, customized specifically based on the measurements to realign the energy uh, that comes from the speaker um, so that we get all the frequencies arriving at the same time and that's why on the impulse response uh, you see that you have a very distinct uh, peak, uh, a very distinct um, uh, pulse uh, spike uh, and that's representing a more transparent sound system so the sound will sound much more natural uh, with that if uh, looking at the the magnitude response um, you see also that the the energy has been aligned uh, for a flat response across the whole frequency range uh, so the the black line which is the average um, is basically on, on zero dB ac across the whole yeah. uh, frequency range. And, but you can, also, <clears throat> you can also see that the blue lines are, um, well, not completely <laughs> aligned, uh, all, all of them. Um, yeah. So, and, and this, this, is, this is where we actually can see that we, are, we, we do have uh, a still some significant uh, variation right uh, in in the blue uh, in the blue response uh, uh, w this is where Dirac live cannot really help you you have i mean room correction cannot really help because here you can see you still have i would say some big variation uh, it's like already uh, 20 dbs in in this frequency here it can also even be don't don't 40 dB. so Although the average response has been significantly improved, we, we still have, with the room correction, some problems. That's, that is this variation. So what this means is that when you go from seat to seat, you will have a variation on, especially in the low frequency, you will have differences. And that's that's one of the problems. So it's, it's really uh, 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 where the room correction did a really great job to build things, I mean, put things together at the speaker level bring the clarity, uh, align everything, but was not able to cope with, let's say, the, the problems in the low frequencies that you had to adjust uh, in a way manually with your subwoofers by aligning them together first before you were doing the uh, room correction. And, and this is when actually uh, you, you decided to go into the, the base control. And here, uh, base control is with the addition of multiple subwoofer management and and what what nilo will explain is that it it really if you look at the bottom curve it really helps get a, a, a much uh, a more uh, i mean a, a subwoofer response that it's optimally blended with the speaker's frequency response and and in the end you also have a, a really reduced as you can see here the seat to seat variation is is really uh, optimized and and that is thanks to what uh, uh, Dirac has implemented with uh, with this multiple subwoofer management yes um and what we realize is then that uh, we cannot control a single speaker and, and get uh, a very good response over a big area uh, and even response, especially in the base region where you have room modes and you have interference between the walls um, so we had to take several speakers into account at the same time and uh, with base control we're doing that with the subwoofers and for the subwoofers we're co-optimizing uh, all pass filters and all pass filter is a filter that doesn't change the magnitude response of a system it only uh, modifies the phase response of that system so you could compare that as to pinpointing a particular problematic frequency and with this all pass filter 
we adjust the timing of that frequency and, and the neighboring frequencies so that they um, align with, uh, uh, with the other subwoofers um, in all the, the measurement positions as much as possible. And the result of that is what you see here, that the variability between different positions has uh, been reduced quite, uh, quite a lot. And this all-pass filter th that uh, only adjusts the phase and not the, the magnitude uh, is used between the subwoofers. So all the subwoofers are aligned using uh, all-pass filters mm -hmm. to create like a one ideal subwoofer. Um, mm -hmm. So the system would eventually just see a single subwoofer that acts uh, ideally across the, the whole listening area. Um, the all pass filter is also applied to the main channels uh, down in the crossover region. Um, so and, and that's applied pairwise to align left and right speaker in the crossover area. So um, at, at the end, we apply a third all pass filter to that pair so that that pair uh, combines very well with the ideal subwoofer. It's a bit complicated to explain by, by word this way, uh, but it's like a three step thing that you do the, the inter subwoofer alignment, then you do the pairwise alignment of the main speakers, and then in the end, you do the crossover combination um, between the pairs and the ideal subwoofer with this all pass filter. <clears throat> yeah, so that's, and, and this has been to us, uh, I mean, at, at Stormodio and for many installers, it's been really a great help. I mean, because this, uh, uh, the, the, the previous implementation with the room correction only, you really had to deal by yourself with the subwoofer. So there are multiple ways to do that, but this requires really a, a, a lengthy process of measurements, alignments, one by one of the subs and all that, and then grouping this and then go for the direct live room correction. With base control, this has been really uh, made easier and with a, a, a remarkable and reproducible uh, performance, and, and this is great. I would say the only downside of base control is that, well, it's it's limited to system with subwoofers. So if, if you have systems where you, you actually uh, only want to have speakers with large, uh, I mean, with base capabilities, it's, it's uh, not managed at the moment. Um, and uh, in the end, when you look a bit more closely to, to, the, to the frequency uh, response, you can see that actually the control uh, in, in the uh, seat to seat variation is, is really good up to the crossover frequency of, of the base management. Because above that, uh, you, 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 well, let's say the system, the, the algorithm does not, uh, cannot manage that. And, and we do have problems there. So the, this is where, where the, let's say, the whole evolution of the direct life tools has brought great solutions, but there was a need to to go for okay, what what how can we improve the rest and where is that coming from, and and this is where I think we we need to start looking at uh, adding another uh, parameter, I mean variable to to the uh, um, information you get of a measurement and. Uh, there has been many different plots uh, that used in the past, and and one of them that we 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 did not illustrate so far is what we call the waterfall plot, and and I would like Nilo that you explain us why this is so important to actually add uh, this this new dimension. Yeah, uh, so what we what we see in the plots uh, is actually energy that is staying in the room that is lingering. Uh, resonating between the walls and so on. Um, a waterfall plot shows you how this energy is spread out across a frequency and also how it uh, decays over time, how it develops over time. Uh, a waterfall plot is not nothing new per se. Um, it, it illustrates what I said, the, the amount of energy across frequencies and across time. Uh, what you see on the plot here uh, is the like the raw room measurement. There is no uh, calibration applied at this at this point. Uh, so you see the high variability of of the the magnitude response, and that's at at t time zero, which is like at the at the far at the bottom of of the um, of the, the the plot, and that represents exactly what you seen in the previous uh, plots. 
Yeah. Uh, what you see coming out of the plot is how this energy that should ideally stop playing, if it would be a, a free field uh, playback, uh, the, the sound wave would pass and, and then it's quiet. But due to the room, the sound will stay in the room and, and um, lead around, hang, hang around for a, for a while. And that's what you see with the long ridges that, that come out of the plot. Um, uh, for example, down there at, at 25 and 50 hertz, you have long ridges that uh, are caused by the room dimension. So at these frequencies, the, the, the dimensions of the room are causing standing waves that um, take very long time to, uh, to decay uh, away. And that would, of course, not be the case if, uh, if this speaker was playing in, in an open free field. Mm -hmm. um, the, the effects of this um, is that you get a more, uh, uh, well, a, a less clear sound, a muddy bass. Um, you get the background noise like of, of the of the bass uh, that is overlaid on the desired sound that you want yeah. to hear. So you hear all the room basically. That's that's what happens here. So yeah. let, let's have a look looking at this plot now. Let's have a look at what the different levels of the uh, room calibration tool, the direct live tool, uh, has come in. Uh, let, let's maybe uh, uh, start uh, focusing on, on room correction. Ca can you tell us what, uh, looking at this plot, room correction has been able to improve? Yeah, so room correction is about the magnitude and the phase response of uh, each individual speaker. And what you see here that is that the magnitude response at the initial, at the, at the bottom of the of the uh, plot, is has this flat uh, characteristic. And um, you can also see that the impulse response has been uh, improved because the the energy is sort of uh, decaying from from the start. It it doesn't decay at a very high rate, but it's at least not growing after uh, the initial um, wavefront. Yeah. Uh, which means that we have managed to phase align uh, the different drivers and the, the different contributions from the early reflections. <clears throat> but we, uh, as you can see, we still have uh, something more to, to wish for, right, Sebastian? Yeah, so in, indeed. I mean, you you still have problems, right? I mean, the, 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 the room correction tool has, has been able to adjust what you say at the very, uh, let's say, early times, but we still see the big troubles that are coming from the room. So the resonances and the modes are still quite present. It's not really improved. And overall, especially in that area, right, the, the decay time is 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 still not uh, optimally controlled. Um, let, let, let's continue this, this travel and, and look at what happens with starting with the base control when, when you, you in, implemented it. Yeah, so now adding base control to the equation where we allow uh, multiple subwoofers to uh, to be co-optimized. So uh, the algorithm uh, considers all the subwoofers in the system at the same time and designs these old pass filters that I uh, described. And this will uh, realign the subwoofers at those problematic frequencies that are causing uh, the, the, the variability uh, across different seating positions. And that variability may be due to the room modes. So uh, if you have a standing wave between two, two walls, um, the energy of that wave would be different from one position to another. Um, and then as a consequence of uh, cancelling that uh, energy, having one subwoofer help the other, uh, we see that these um, uh, th these ridges have been a couple of them have been uh, really well controlled uh, after the initial uh, wave. So we see, uh, for example, that the 50 hertz is is considerably uh, reduced uh, compared to the room correction, but we still have some issues. Indeed, uh, and I let you continue on that. Yeah, so uh, neither base control nor room correction can address the late reflections. So uh, base control will uh, base align uh, subwoofers to, 
to contribute constructively in, in a good way uh, across different seating uh, positions but if there is uh, remaining energy later in the uh, in the room uh, neither room correction nor base control uh, is is able to capture that in a good way uh, so you still have this long ridge at, at 25 hertz for example yeah. so that uh, uh, well that, that led us to take another step in in our yeah indeed so clearly if, if we were to, to summarize i mean both room correction and base control we're focusing on on speaker per speaker basically uh, adjustments so you 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 analyze each speaker response and you try to play on its impulse response and all that but we 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 understand that they are all working together in the room and and in a way by just looking at them individually uh, we we are not able to control everything and if you try to do so you would actually uh, continuing with the same let's say process you would end up with maybe more problems so this is this is when at, at Dirac you decided to 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 use some other technologies that you tested in the in the automotive and this is what what gave gave sorry birth to uh, the active room treatment here. Um, so what what's what have you done with uh, with the active room treatment? Maybe I can uh, illustrate that by this uh, short animation and and you can then uh, describe what exactly uh, is done. Yeah, so what we're seeing is a speaker, the right uh, front right speaker, playing a, a desired sound, and uh, the the sound will be uh, well diffracted in different uh, directions, and it will reflect. For example, in this case, it's uh, reflecting off the right side wall, and there is interference at the listening position. So, time um, sound arriving at different times from that speaker and uh, one direct wave and one reflected wave um, will interfere and cause uh, a smearing of, of the, the sound. And if this uh, reflection is allowed to, to continue, uh, it will build up these uh, room modes and the room reverberation uh, in the end. So what active room treatment does then is to allow other speakers to contribute to cancel out those reflections at at the positions where where the reflections occur and um, so we introduced the concept of the main speaker which is the speaker that is playing the side sound the dedicated sound for that speak for that channel uh, in this case it's the right front uh, speaker that is the main speaker and the other two speakers, so it's a, a left speaker and a, a subwoofer illustrated here in this image, they are called uh, support speakers uh, for the main speaker. So the support speakers are um, helping the main speaker to um, handle and optimize the impulse response and handle the re late reflections, uh, which is not possible to do with the main speaker itself. So the main speaker itself cannot handle its late reflections. Uh, if, if we would try, maybe that would be possible in one point uh, in, in the room, but um, it wouldn't be possible for a, for a listening experience. We have two ears and we're not sitting still. Um, so that's why support speakers at different occasions are very, very helpful and useful in um, optimizing the impulse response of the main speaker. And um, all the speakers in the system can be main speakers and all the speakers can also be support speakers at the same time, actually. So um, if we would just mirror this image, you, you have the left speaker as the main speaker and uh, the other uh, speakers would be support speakers at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that's what active room treatment uh, is doing. It's using all the speakers in your system to contribute and help uh, each of the speakers uh, to attain their ideal impulse response as close as possible. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, I mean, obviously uh, here we represent like a laser beam. Uh, of course, an acoustical wave is, is not behaving this way, but for the sake of the illustration, this was important to show, uh, I mean, to visualize the reflection, the effects of the support speaker. So if, if, I, if I summarize what you just said about active room treatment is that for now, this is the first system that actually is able to utilize all available speakers 
by uh, uh, creating now the notion of a main speaker and support speakers. Each speaker is a main speaker, but each speaker can be a support speaker to all the others. So when you have, for example, the left channel that is playing is direct sounds, you will have the other speakers supporting it in the low frequencies to uh, optimize uh, and control the, 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 the room uh, uh, and the room response. And we will illustrate that a little bit further. So meaning that the number of the support speaker is important in, in the way the system works. And this will depend uh, mainly on, on the processor capability. I mean, it's, it's power basically. Um, it really is not something to replace the uh, uh, room treatment. This is something to complement. Active room treatment is uh, designed uh, at the moment to work up to 150 Hz extremely efficiently. Uh, um, uh, and above that, I would say, this is where the passive room treatment is important and should remain. But this is where this is quite easy for passive room treatment to work, while this is definitely not the case uh, uh, in, in the lowest frequency. And something that I'd like uh, uh, um, maybe you, you clarify is <clears throat> how is that actually working in, <clears throat> in the control? How does that cancel thing? Can you explain a little bit this? Yeah, this so uh, base trap <clears throat> are there to sort of absorb energy um, at, at, crit at critical positions, for example, in the corners where, where you have energy buildups or in the base area. Uh, what we're doing instead is that we're using basically the, the speakers that you have available in your system to do that cancellation actively. Uh, so the, during the measurement, we have taken a fingerprint of the, the, the speaker system in that room and how it behaves in the different measure, measurement positions. And with that information, we know how the sound propagates in the room. We know uh, how the different speaker different speakers contribute to the to the listening position so we can therefore design a filter for all the speakers uh, that then together ensure that the sound that comes from the left front speaker uh, propagates naturally uh, through the listening area with help from the other speakers and when the wave sort of reaches the the, the walls there are other speakers there that act as absorbers or cancelers so that you don't get the undesired reflections and the energy buildup. Uh, we thereby avoid an energy buildup in, in, in that room. So you okay. could, um, it could be compared, for example, uh, very, very uh, uh, sloppily with an active noise cancellation system. Uh, active noise cancellation would play um, anti-sound in, in your headphones to uh, to cancel out disturbing noise from outside. Uh, that active noise cancellation is using a microphone to analyze what is coming and then it's playing like anti-sound inside. Um, we don't need that microphone in real time uh, in active treatment because we know we know the sound that the speakers are supposed to play because that's what comes from the system. Um, and we know how the room reflections are affecting um, the, the, the listening area. So we don't need that microphone in real time there because we know already from the beginning mm -hmm. what is the intended sound and how will the, the room uh, affect that sound. That's very interesting. So actually the room is the noise and the room is learned by the measurements. And, and th this, this is why we can compare that. And that's really interesting. So and in the end, it's it's really helping replacing bulky passive room treatment, and and the, the the it's made possible because Dirac is actually taking control over time, and 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 this uh, uh, again, uh, if I understood correctly, is really about still working about optimizing the impulse response, exactly. leading into in the end controlling the room decay time, and yeah. this is. What <clears throat> illustrates again <clears throat> the, the plots that we have on the right, and and I think this is uh, uh, fundamental to uh, uh, zoom a little bit into that to to check the the effects of of the active room treatment, the key effects uh, that we have here. Um, what what Nilo mentioned earlier is that 
uh, with with room correction and base control, you 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 are not able to really get control of of the lingering of the base. With with active room treatment, and and this is what you can uh, clearly see on 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 these areas here, and and also already in in the very low frequency, the improvements is quite significant, so about 20 dBs. Um, I mean, sorry, yet more than 10 dBs improvement here. It's it's really getting a, a much better control. Uh, it also helps, and this is extremely impressive, and that is what you would, let's say, be able to identify immediately when you listen to uh, the system when, when art is active, is that the decay time is extremely well controlled and, and all over the low frequency range. So up until 150 hertz, you can see that this is extremely steep, extremely tight, and that is what translates in, into uh, uh, this, this, starter, this starter base. But uh, during the old, all the experimentation we've done is we, we, we had actually other positive side effects, which were really about all of a sudden when art was active, you, you get this nice uh, tight bass response and controlled sound, but you also had all of a sudden a, a much wider uh, sweet spots, meaning that if, if you change your position in, uh, around the sweet spot, you compared to the traditional stereo experience, I would say you you end up with less problems. It's it's much smoother the transition between the sweet spot and the rest of the room. So that's that was and this is quite in, impressive with active room treatment, and it also helped really fills the room with bass. So it's not only in the listening space. I mean, we, we did experiment that right at the CES in, in the suites where we had the demo. Even if you were going to places where we did not actually capture the room, the bass response was still quite accurate and strong. And, and that's really why this is, uh, uh, and this is the essence of direct live active room treatment is that because we have the control over time, we can capture the bad energy that is normally coming from the walls, we can compensate it with the support speaker at the same time where the direct sound is created by the speaker. And this is by controlling these uh, uh, bad reflections, by compensating from these reflections, at the same time you have the direct sound playing that actually you don't hear the room anymore. You just get rid of the room and, and you, you can enjoy that. And that's really key. And 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 it's measurable. I mean, if you if you have your tools, you play with art, make the before and after. It's not only your ears, but this is something that is tangible that can be measured. So now, uh, th th this is let's say what the, the theory is all about at on the active room treatment systems. But what our customers are really interested on, in, our installers are interested in, is about the tool. So can you can you give us some? Um, uh, explanation about the evolution of the tool when art is is now coming yes of course uh, so uh, those of you that have used the direct live uh, calibration tool uh, recognize it still uh, you do the same measurements that, as we've done before you can even open and an, a measurement project that you've done before and apply active room treatment to that uh, we have the same target curves as, as previously. Uh, the target curve adjustment, you see the simplified one that we introduced about a year ago here. And there's also still the, the advanced one with uh, the more detailed uh, uh, frequency response uh, design you can make there. Uh, we have the same channel groupings in the end um, at, at, at the right side. And what we what is new now is that we added this ART button, active room treatment button. So that's uh, where you can select to apply active room treatment instead of uh, direct light room correction or any of the base control uh, options. Um, the other new thing is at the bottom left where you see uh, what we call the support range uh, sliders. And, and this is the frequency range that different uh, speaker groups are allowed to contribute and help and support the selected speaker group that you uh, are visualizing at the moment uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the target response and all that. So what you see in the main graph is the left and right front speakers. And what you see at the bottom there are the sliders for, the, for that speaker group, the left and right front, plus the other uh, speaker groups. So you can select uh, the frequency range where the other speakers are supporting this uh, one. 
and uh, that is th the control you have over this um, so if a speaker is smaller uh, then obviously it cannot reproduce the same amount of bass and it should not be dragged all the way down to 20 hertz uh, and actually the measurements are providing the initial estimation of the, the lower cutoff, the, the limit frequency for uh, each speaker group. So that is set by default. And then uh, you as a user can modify that. Uh, if you think that the speakers are actually more capable than, than the, the automatic assessment uh, has uh, decided, then you can adjust the slider accordingly. And those are the main uh, new things. Yeah, so that's very interesting. And, and this is here uh, uh, what, what is uh, really important, I think, in the tool is that uh, we, we are talking now about speaker capability. Uh, we, we, we do not talk, and this is what's in, indicated here, we don't talk about base management anymore. Uh, actually, the base management is, it comes as a consequence of all the adjustments that you do here. The, the only time where I would say the traditional base management uh, vision comes is whenever you have a speaker that is, is set with a, a kind of decreased lower frequency capability, here maybe this one is at 40 hertz. Well, all the frequencies that are below 40 hertz, that is speaker, this speaker will not play, will, will be uh, uh, played by all the other support speakers that are uh, defined with a wider uh, frequency range capability. And, and that's the key. You will not think about crossover anymore, so there is no transition between subs and speakers. It's all automatically determined by the uh, uh, cursors, the sliders that you have here. And that's key, really key. And, and that's very important. The, on, the other thing is that you can see now the max frequency, this is the, the, the max support frequency is adjusted by default at 150 hertz, and this is the, the max of the system at the, at the moment. And you can adjust that as well. If you have subwoofer uh, that uh, uh, you know will not play uh, above uh, maybe 80 or 90 hertz, well, you, you can always uh, uh, stop them at 90 hertz, and you will, sh you will be sure that it will not get any support frequencies uh, in that area. So in the end, this is a very, let's say, from a theory standpoint, it's a complicated technology that has been given to you with easy ways to adjust. This is the default mode with the sliders, but you can also have, in this area, you can have access to some, let's say, deeper adjustments that uh, we'll explain in, in the future, uh, uh, let's say, tutorials, webinars, uh, but that gives a, a lot of flexibility. In the end, I think the tool is, is really uh, uh, nice and easy to use, and, and it, <clears throat> it really helps say that overall, the active room treatment from, from the experience that we, we had so far uh, is really a revolution to the way uh, the room calibration uh, can be done these days. This is the only uh, solutions at the moment that can use all the speakers to uh, help uh, get a proper response in, in the room. And, and it makes the most out of your system. So you don't have to think about, oh, do I have to add more speakers? Do I have to change my configuration? No, no, no. Out is taking measurements of the room. There is enough measurements to understand the behavior of each speaker because you are taking multiple positions. So we are analyzing the, uh, the way it is reflected, the reverberation time and all that, all is encaptured in these uh, measurements that we take. And, and this helps create all the different filters and it use whatever speakers is there. So if you have only, uh, let's say bookshelf, I mean, of speakers that are not low frequency capable, well, it doesn't matter because actually uh, since the system works up to 150 hertz, uh, the, if your speaker cannot do, go lower than 80, it is still used from 80 to 150, which is great because that's where we, we do have a lot of problems in the room. So it makes the most out of your system, the existing one. You can forget about base management. So it's, it's where this is a kind of revolution again. It's, you don't think base management anymore. You think about base reproduction. I have a speaker that can do bass. Well, let it play the bass. We will make sure that if there is a sub somewhere and other speakers, that 
we help this speaker provide a good and accurate base response in the room. And this will be the case for all the main, I mean, the speakers, whenever they are in, in the main position and helped by the different support speaker. And <clears throat> what's another magic, and to me, that's certainly the, the main revolution of it, is that you don't need a subwoofer. It's actually, if you have speakers that are capable in the low frequencies, they will work in the same way as if you were using subwoofers. And that's no system can do at the moment. This, this is the only system that helps take all the speakers uh, uh, into an integrated solution. It does something that was not able uh, uh, so far by controlling the decay time and the unpursed response. And it, it really is uh, important because it is what, in the end, gives you the sound as it should be. I mean, in any studios, they have a perfectly controlled decay time. So whenever they are recording, they are adjusting or let's say setting the way the reverberation should be for their content. So they expect you to get something similar. So with a proper control of the decay time in your reproduction room, you will get the sound as it should be. It reduces significantly the resonances and, and this is where it's really problematic, problematic uh, for the bass. And, and, and this is where art is doing magic with providing very tight, very uh, uh, articulated bass. And what I also like very much is that because of all this, because you can use speakers, I mean, it can do more with less. You do not need to go up to 16 subwoofers to have a properly controlled bass in the room. You can do it. Art is able to manage any number of subwoofer any number of speakers. It's really depending on your processor. At Storm Audio, we can deal up to 32 channels with art, and, and this is really good. But it's not only for 32 channels. If, like with the Storm Audio, you need to create additional stereo zones, for example, art will be usable in those stereo zones, and it is already working with two channels. The left channel become the support speaker of the right channel. This is reciprocal, and this works. It's, it's really working fine. And, and that's, that's also one of the uh, magic and one of the uh, revolution that uh, we, we see here. Uh, it's, it's not something that is only on the paper. We, we've gone through multiple uh, demos, a lot of experimentation, and uh, we already got, uh, uh, and Dirac got a few awards on, on this. And that's really an illustration of what it does. So how will this be uh, translated into a Storm Audio offer? Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to tell you that all products that you uh, you, you acquired uh, in 2023, so starting January 1st, they are all uh, uh, getting access to art. For models that you bought before 2023, well, you will have to go to uh, the Direct Live portal and buy the license. It is at $299 US at the moment. Depending on the product you have, you will have, uh, let's say, a different grade of the art capabilities. With Core, so our 16-channel processor, you will have up to 10 support speakers, subwoofers, per speaker, I mean, per main speaker, which, if you look at it, it's already quite significant. Uh, the other products, depending on the model, you will have more uh, support speakers. Uh, and this is important to mention that because we, we did not cover that topic, but actually uh, we, we did mention uh, that this, the system, I mean, the, the magic of the art is that it really helped get control of the decay time working on the impulse response. But there is nowhere in information about, okay, yeah, but what is the decay time you, you're targeting? And, and the answer is that there is no such target defined. It's really improving the impulse response and it does it up to whatever speakers you have in the room, which means that the more speakers you have, depending on the size of the room, the more control you get. So if you feel that after your experimentation, you have maybe too much control, you, you feel that it, it starts to be uh, may, maybe too control, well, you, you will simply have to reduce the number of support speakers and that you can do in the tool, you can exclude speakers and the selection will we'll, we'll have to be done in, in a way that we will explain, of course, but it, it makes sense to think of, you need to coverage, to have a good cover of your room when you do the support selection, the support speaker selection. Um, so core will have up to 10. Uh, on the other processor, you will be able to drive uh, many more, uh, uh, up to 18 or 20 speakers, which is really significant. And, and that's, that's what it is. So we'll be launching soon. 
Uh, we'll start with a beta program uh, that we'll do with some uh, selected uh, integrators who, who have, let's say, uh, interesting setups that we can uh, challenge and, and, and verify. Um, we will have a, a launch at the IN show where with Dirac and other partners will have a, a huge room with 11.7.6 setup, so seven subwoofers and, and very capable speakers. It is in May, mid-May, and that's about when uh, Dirac Art will launch uh, at, at Storm Audio. And we'll, we'll have an exclusivity until end of this year, and we're really proud to have partnered with Dirac on that. Uh, I mean, they really helped make this, um, this uh, experiments uh, i mean this experience a great a great thing so if we if we summarize uh, before we go into the questions the key benefits uh is that heart is meant to be uh, a support to all the uh, passive treatment that you have and especially uh, below 150 years it helps you get rid of really the bulky passive treatment that you you might you may have to use if you do not have such active treatment it it makes really uh, um it changed the world uh, in, in in that aspect and and uh, whether you use uh, uh, speakers or subwoofers will make use of everything to control to control the system and that that's that's really nice from from a reproduction standpoint it put things together i mean it's all of a sudden all your different nodes get really synchronized in time and that's what makes your uh, the intelligibility of the sound, the clarity on, on the reproduction, and in the end, uh, a much more stable and deeper sound stage. It works without subwoofers, so if you have capable speakers, you can think of only using speakers if you wish, but of course, if you want to go extremely low in the frequencies, the use of more subwoofers is of help and will always provide a, a, a better, uh, let's say, sound response, I mean, a better coverage of the, the, the wider bandwidth. But any bookshelf speaker, is also used. Uh, it becomes a support speaker because most of speakers will have frequency response or frequency capabilities uh, down to uh, maybe 100 hertz at least. So 100 to 150 hertz uh, is where we can use them. So that's that's really key. Um, you don't need a subwoofer, and it was demonstrated very well uh, with the demos we had at the Viale, with the Viale at the ISC. Uh, it was extremely impressive to see how low we can go, how control we could have uh, the, the the reproduction. Uh, and in the end, uh, it, it also helps uh, not look only at rectangular dedicated home cinema space, but it becomes extremely powerful also in spaces where actually passive treatment is, is quite a challenge. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, open space uh, where you have multiple uh, areas. Uh, art is really uh, doing great things here. Um, and, and, and I think this is really the key benefits of, uh, of what active room treatment is, is doing. Um, we, we do have questions. We have significantly less questions than yesterday. <laughs> you know, so I think we'll, uh, we'll try to, to answer them now. Uh, so we have a question about uh, wh whether with base control we can, we can use the base routing. So uh, this is something specific to Storm, uh, the, the base routing capability. The answer is actually uh, no. Uh, direct base control needs to have the full access and the full control of what you play in the subwoofer to work properly. Uh, and maybe Nilo, you can confirm or not, but uh, you, you need to have, if you have four subwoofers, uh, the, the content of the four subs need to be managed by, by Dirac to have the proper uh, base control uh, management. Yeah. The second question is about, okay, does Dirac Live Suite work with art? and base control at the same time or one at the time if first option applies is base, con base control included in art so maybe here nilo you can clarify the way it works yeah so uh, i mean this is uh, partly a technical question and partly a commercial question i i uh, i take it uh, so uh, base control and active room treatment are complementary technologies they're doing different things and addressing different issues um, so uh, we will have a way to sort of upgrade or uh, add on active room treatment feature uh, on top of the base control feature is that uh, what, what you have at, at the moment. Um, so they're not working at the same time, they're not active at the same time, they are 
working uh, uh, they replace uh, each other uh, but having said that there will be pricing options for uh, if you have the base control you can upgrade to you can add the active room treatment at, at, a, at a nice cost uh, but if you don't have the base control, the, the active room treatment add-on will be a higher a higher, um, uh, a higher uh, uh, license um, because you get like a base management uh, implicit uh, from the active room treatment. So uh, the way we would bundle this would be that uh, when you buy active room treatment and you have subwoofers in your system. Uh, then the base control will be like uh, a required license as well, so it would be bundled together with the active room treatment license. Okay, That's, I think this is clear. Uh, we have a question about with this, would bigger top side and rear speakers be better help? Uh, so the question I mean, is, I mean, does size matter? <laughs> and and, yes. and yeah, I, I, I think we can we can say that of course uh, i mean if if you want to have a a, a control that that is uh, let's say wider spread or, or or easier to manage it 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 does help to have speakers more capable but you should not see this as a constraint to the system uh, you you can keep defining your your setup with the traditional let's say small speakers plus subwoofers this also works what art is opening uh, is that for now um, um, the base that is supposed to come from a certain speaker we will make sure that it is reproduced by this given speaker as low as possible i mean to its lowest capability and this is something new uh, so far when you were adjusting your crossover for your base management this was really uh, you know, if you cut at AD, well, the speaker will stop playing at AD and the subs will take over. With the active room treatment, if a speaker can go down to 30 hertz, well, its bass will be played down to 30 hertz. And if it can help a subwoofer to compensate for the uh, reverberation, I mean, the reflection above 30 hertz up to maybe 80 hertz, it will do it. So. This is why base management is a kind of confusing points on the art because it's a very it, it goes much further than the base management. It's really like you have a base reproduction that I mean base that should be played at a certain speaker. Well, it will be reproducing that speaker down to its capability, and then we'll use the other speakers and subwoofers to manage the rest of the frequency range. So that that's where this is magic, and and therefore yes. You can now think maybe more uh, uh, creatively, I would say, if you have customers who are really more in the, uh, uh, let's say, music, etc. You you can even think of having really wide speakers, I mean, wide bandwidth speakers in the front, and it actually it helps also simplify and get a, a much better reproduction for the screen channels because uh, you you can most of them can go quite low. So Hart is taking the best out of any speaker that you put in the room. So that's the key of it, I think. You, you want to add something to that, Nilo, or? Just that uh, if you if you have band-limited speakers, like uh, one speaker goes down to 40, another to 60, um, you, you will not have problems below 40 uh, because the speakers are not playing there. So you don't need to correct for down to 20 Hertz, for example. So uh, uh, active room treatment, as Sebastian said, will make the best use of your, your existing speakers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we have question about the frequency range coverage. So right, right, right now, uh, Art is designed to work up to 150 hertz. Uh, um, I, I know, of course, uh, uh, you, you want to extend a little bit, but this is not yet finalized. I think in in, in the max capability, but uh, the target is to try to go above that. Uh, to mm -hmm. help uh, actually the, the the i think the driving thing here is about making sure that we can have a very smooth uh, let's say uh, decay control between what the passive treatment will do and what the active treatment will do so right. we, we all know that uh, in the range of like 150 to 250 or something like this this part it might still be a problem for passive treatment to cover so that's why it will be nice to go a bit further 
uh, what we've experimented in the rooms we've been in is that already with this 150 years capability, it provides an amazing result. So when it goes beyond, it's going to be even, even more uh, uh, capable. So that, that's very interesting. Uh, the question is also about um, the LFE range. Uh, the, the thing is, we are not looking at subwoofers or speakers differently. We are looking at, uh, let's say, low frequency capabilities. So the, the system will indeed, for at least for the LFE, will look at reproducing it mainly on the subwoofers. But as soon as a speaker or another subwoofer in the room has its support frequency range defined that is in the LFE frequency capabilities, it will help, meaning that LFE uh, will be supported by all the speakers that are capable in the room. And that, to the benefit of having a very tight response of this LFE signal in the room. And, and that's why this is, again, uh, so magic to have the capability to use the, the, uh, all the speakers in the room to, to really uh, uh, strengthen uh, the bass response. OK. What are the restrictions of the space which is optimized in relation to the room boundaries? OK, and how many measurements should be used at the minimum? So I will answer the second part, and you take care of the first one. You know. So <laughs> from measurement standpoint, there are no differences compared to the existing tool. Uh, what we've experimented is that you can start five measurements is the minimum. You can go up to whatever you want. There is actually no limit to the, the eye count. Now, regarding the boundaries, I led it to you, uh, Nilo. If you want me to repeat, you I can. But yeah, I no, I see it. Uh, so restrictions of the space which is optimized in relation to the room boundaries. Uh, so the, the space which is optimized is should be the space where you're expected to have people sitting. Um, and you can, as with the room correction with base control, you can also choose different uh, seating scenarios. Uh, where you can have a, a, a tight uh, sweet spot or you can have a wider sweet spot. Um, and how that relates to the room boundaries is not really uh, defined. Um, what, you should, uh, uh, what you should try to avoid is to be too close to, to one particular speaker that you're using as a support speaker. So you should not sit with, with your surround speaker right here, um, no. if, if that is sort of contributing to um, uh, to, to uh, as a support speaker. Um, so there is no such relation be between the, the, the size of the sweet spot and the size of the room. Um, okay. So far. Okay, the next question is about, can we assign speakers to just be support? And, and here I think I, I can answer. Um, the idea is no, and you don't want that. Uh, what happens is uh, you will define your setup for considering your active speakers. I mean, you want to create a Dolby Atmos environment, you want to create a home cinema environment where you want to play all the different uh, codecs. So you will look for this first, your layout first. Then what happens is that if you play a stereo content in there, well, guess what? The speakers that were adjusted as being support in the tool they will be playing when 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 this when only this stereo content plays on the left and right because they are used to compensate and create this decay time control. So in a way, you don't have to have specific support speakers. They will all become support if you define that in the tool when you do the uh, uh, adjustments. Uh, so do not add more speakers for that. Of course, it always. It, it can help, yes, but that's not the target you need to have in mind. You just need to think that in any systems that you have existing, art will go into, uh, we will play in improving it and making use in the best way of all the speakers. So we have a question about the range of the support. Will this extend to 300 Hertz? And I, I don't believe that's the target that you have in mind. Um, no, that's maybe a bit high uh, on the high side. Uh, as a target um, yeah I, th I think especially if we consider that uh we we all know that uh you know s above a certain threshold uh, ref roughly maybe 200 hertz and something like that I mean, 
that's that can start to be more audible and and that's that's when you don't want to go into something that the the becomes uh i mean not as good as otherwise so here here that's where the passive room treatment is is still making a lot of sense you you, you need to use the best out of it i mean as anything you have things that are good in some things bad in others and here the idea is to make the best of all the elements in the room arts will take care of everything for now up to 150 years then the passive treatment takes over uh, in the future we hope to expand uh, uh, up to maybe 200 i don't know but something that will make a, a wider coverage but not uh, to a point where it actually does not make sense uh, physically speaking okay some other questions are coming that's nice Okay, how does Dirac prevent a speaker from bottoming out? Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, so I, I don't know if you have some answer, but what I can tell you is that the the um, this is mainly something that you would adjust at at the processor level. It's not really something that Dirac manages. The the control of the 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 power that you would send to your certain speaker or subwoofer is something that you can control by adjusting limiters. In, in in the ISP uh, uh, to make sure that you will not have a, a bottoming. Uh, once this is adjusted, then you can you can run the, the tool in uh, in a normal way, and and you will not override. Uh, so I I don't believe uh, we need more uh, onto that question. Uh, what else do we have? <clears throat> Okay, we have questions about, I mean, is the art, let's say, decreasing the, not the quality, but uh, you have the direct sound coming from a certain speaker and you will have the support, let's say, range that is added to it. The question is really about, is that at some point degrading the, the system uh, i have my answer but i think i want yours you know <laughs> yeah uh, not that we have seen and if you look at it like uh, that all speakers are acting as support speakers to each other uh, it, it makes sense that uh, a speaker will be supported uh, especially uh, down at, at the lower frequencies uh, so that its uh, its main content uh, will not require as much power because it gets support from the other speakers not only to cancel out the reflections but also to to generate the direct wave uh, from the right uh, direction so um, I, I, I my take on it is that it, it will not change the the uh, well it, it will not negatively change the the capabilities of, of the speakers uh, because they are helping each other in, yeah. in, in an equal way yeah and especially when you're playing stereo content uh, you will have help from the surround speakers uh, and, and the subwoofers so you would really alleviate the work for for the main sp uh, stereo speakers yeah yeah and and i think uh we, we we should always go back to what it does i mean i think people have the perception that we you 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 are we are acting real time like we we get the sound and then oh we do, we do compensate but actually the thing is art is taking control over time so by the measurements you you get the main speaker you get you, you can define the different, uh, uh, let's say, signals that each support speaker should get. But what happens is that when, when then we do the playback, this is all in sync. It's, it's in perfect timing. So it is really as such the, the, the poor sound that the room walls would create due to the reflection was instantaneously, I mean, suppressed by these uh, uh, signals that are adding to each of the support speakers so it's actually uh, 
taking it out before. So that that's these signals that are taken out from the signals that you have on the other speakers. I mean, it, and also in the main speakers, if it helps the others. So in in a way, it's 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 actually making sure that you get rid of the room, and this is what you want because you don't want to hear the room when you listen to a system. You want to hear the, the speakers, what they are reproducing, and, and that's the key. Um, so we have other questions about, uh, uh, is there a low pass filter uh, per speaker? So the answer is yes. Uh, we, we've shown the, uh, the the sliders. The sliders, you can adjust the, the low, uh, so the high cut frequency. So what is the lowest frequency they can play? But you can also adjust uh, uh, whether you want a speaker to to not play above a certain frequency, a certain frequency, and especially if you have subwoofers, for example, this is where you you might want to be more careful. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, this is adjustable. Okay. Okay, we have the question about extension to 250 hertz or whatever we will define. Will that take more processing? Well, the answer is, uh, of course, everything has a cost. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the way we will be working is that we'll make sure if we, we do something that is workable in the existing uh, in the existing ecosystems. I mean, I don't know, Nilo, if you want to add to that, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's true what you say. Um, you, you do more, you, it costs more. Um, yeah. But there are always smart things that you can do to yeah, indeed. Uh, use that load. Yeah, yeah, and as I mentioned also, you know, at, at, at Storm Audio, we, when we designed the ISP family a few years ago, uh, uh, we, 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 we really took care of having enough resources, uh, bandwidth and capability, so headroom, basically. To the point that actually uh, our MK1 owner, so who bought the product in 2017, early 2017, will be able to use art in the exact same way as if they were buying the current product, and that's really important for us to to bring that to uh, to to our different uh, customers. So we have the question about whether there are some uh, uh, more technical papers about that. So uh, I think I remember Nilo, you have some uh, publications or blogs in in your websites yes uh, we have some white paper on on the technology um yeah one with the spatial spatial uh spatial room, spatial correction, room correction i think it's yeah. called uh, it's also been uh, published by uh, yes. audio express yeah audio express you're right yes so there are publications so go to the website the rack website and you will find this information Okay, uh, we have a question about when you adjust the frequency range of a certain speaker, what happens to the frequencies that are low, lower? Like if you fix at 60 hertz, what happens to the frequencies below 60 hertz? Uh, uh, well, the answer is that this is when I would say the kind of traditional bass management works. Uh, the, the subwoofer and the uh, other support speakers will play, will help this speaker that is limited uh, to get its uh, normally uh, bass, I mean, reproduced bass to be played in the other speakers. Uh, is that correct, Nilo? Yes, correct. So it's a uh, quite effect, uh, effective uh, high pass filter that is applied at, at the bottom end of the, the support range. Okay. Okay. And the last question we have is, is more about uh, bass control. Uh, so with with ARTS, we now have the possibility to really make use of uh, all the speakers, all subwoofers, and we can even define, uh, let's say, the capability uh, uh, on, on, on each of them. So the question is whether bass control will evolve also to be able to define different size or, let's say, different capability on the subwoofers. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, base control is also measurement based. So we would measure like the sensitivity of the speaker uh, of the subwoofer and take that into account. So, um, in in that respect, uh, I think yes, the, you can have different sized subwoofers in your system. Okay. Okay. All right. So the other question is about when you extend so what what would be the goal to extend to above 150 hertz <laughs> and uh, well i mean you can answer but i have also my answer go ahead 
Yeah, I think you phrased it well, uh, and that's to get a more uh, well co cohesive um, uh, transition to passive uh, methods. Yeah. So not all passive methods go up down as far as 150 hertz. Yeah. So that leaves like a a, a gap. Yeah. yeah. Cle clearly, yeah. this is a, not a gray area, but this is this is where the, there is still work to do. I mean, there is still work we can do actively. To help so that's that's why uh, this, this makes sense uh, most of the rooms that we've been working on that's that's our let's say using a, a traditional passive treatment is is having a very smooth transition so I, I don't see any problem but you might end up with rooms where it would be nice uh, to extend and and this is why uh, I mean Dirac is still working on that and and that would come uh, as evolution of the tool uh, and also the devices that would be uh, um, uh, make, making use of it. Right. Okay, is there a need for a, a better microphone for art? So no. just to give you uh, an idea, so at, at Storm Audio, we are still, uh, it's not recommending, but still uh, advising that uh, you can use the UMIC one from uh, Mini DSP. This is the one we package with our calibration kits. And so far, uh, it, it still is uh, a, a good uh, microphone, but of course, uh, if you have your own uh, more precise, uh, more accurate um, uh, microphone, you are free to use it. Uh, there, there is no issue here. Um, uh, but but we, we do not say that uh, you have to go for a more precise microphone because of art. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Okay. Okay, so yeah, our Earthworks microphone are of course uh, great to be used, uh, so go ahead with that. Uh, so the frequency at the moment, again, uh, it goes together with that uh, support frequency. So the max art capability is 150 hertz right now. I mean, what this means is that the support speakers will be used uh, up to 150 hertz. So that's, that's what it means. Is there an optimal number of support speaker for, say, a 7.2.4 system? Well, there is no answer here. It depends on the room. Uh, what we can say is that you, the, the system, at by default, will make use of all the speakers you have. If you end up with more speakers, then you can define support speakers for the system. At some point, you will be offered the choice to exclude some and include others. So that's the idea. And indeed, this will depend on the processor capability. Um, and in the end, the number of speaker will be what uh, uh, translates into a, 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 a tighter control. Let's make it this way. Mm. So that here is something that will depend a lot on, on, on the room. On, on the speaker, so that's something that the experimentation, so when you will do your calibration, uh, doing some listening tests, maybe some also post measurements, uh, you, you'll be able to uh, uh, to verify that. So, and, and then decide that, okay, well, may, maybe that's too controlled. Let's get, let's remove some of the support speakers from the system. And and that's the good thing of it is you, you still have flexibility on that. Um, so try with more and, do with less if you need. Uh, that's that's what you I would say I can do. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So and the last question is about what is the maximum frequency you can use out? Twenty kilohertz, for example. So okay. So let's clarify. So direct live art is a combination of the art technology below 150 hertz and the Dirac Live room correction above 150 hertz. So as such, it does cover the full frequency range if you decide to. Uh, you can also decide that by moving the uh, what we call the curtains, you can decide to, to not cover a certain frequency range above maybe, for example, 500, 600 hertz, depends on what you, 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 you want. And then that's really what uh, Dirac Live room correction was doing so far. And art will take over below 150 hertz. So that's that's the key thing. And this is why Nilo explained that arts 
goes as uh, something on top of the existing technologies. And, and this is why, from a license standpoint, you, you need to, of course, if to go to this $299, you will have to get, of obviously, already a base control uh, in, in your uh, portfolio of uh, license that you, um, you, you, you acquired. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, we have a question about uh, the uh, Storm XT working together with ours. Okay, so actually, um, it will absolutely not change the existing behavior uh, when you look at the signal, the content itself, so the direct sound. Uh, so whatever the decoder we produce, whatever our Storm XT technology will do to help get rid of silent speakers, outcomes, let's say, at a lower level it comes at really the speaker level so you need to think about in one hand you have the uh, signal feed that you get from the decoding and in the other hand what we provide to the speakers to to get the correction the right correction so these are totally uh, uh, separate uh, separated things so if if you have a speaker that is getting a signal that is uh, created by storm xt well obviously if this main speaker as support speakers well in the low frequency portion so below 150 hertz where you have defined your uh, uh, your uh, uh, arts uh, uh, capability the signal might be compensated in the other speakers and that's the case for any uh, direct sound and that's the whole idea with the uh, active room treatment okay uh right so what else do we have so i think no okay so the answer is we cannot move the art curtain above 150 hertz at the moment uh whenever the two evolve with uh, a bit higher uh, frequency coverage the the cursor for the highest frequency will be able to move but for now this is 150 hertz by default and you can decide to go lower for some subwoofers for example and that was the last question nilo so i think we uh we good uh Great that was very interesting questions that you had um so thanks again all for uh participating today thanks nilo for uh your uh, your lights into uh, uh this new technology again we are uh, uh, very happy to uh, collaborate on that we are looking forward to the beta programs to the release of the tool and uh, and our software mid-May. Um, until then, you will hear from us uh, uh, about the beta program uh, for 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 those uh, um, who are in touch, and and we'll we'll uh, let you know how this works. Thank you very much. Handouts uh, you can download them right away. Video that will be in the follow-up email. You will have a link. Nilo. Thank you for your time. Have a good day and and all of you a uh, good day, good night and uh see you for a next uh, webinar. Thanks. Bye. Bye.